Hey guys, welcome back to the Vintage Televisions Alignment Series. In this installment, I'm going to be laying out some basic concepts in as simple a manner as I can. And I want to make it clear up front that although I think everything I'm going to say is conceptually accurate, it is not technically, literally accurate. I'm going to gloss over and simplify some stuff so we can move forward with this. Uh, I'm going to show some basic building blocks, talk a little bit about theory, we're going to take a look at the actual broadcast signal, different components of it, and talk a little bit about basic circuits and how they achieve certain frequency response curves. All right, let's start out with some really basic radio concepts. I've drawn here a simple theoretical radio in block form. Let's go through it. We have an antenna that's going to be picking up all sorts of radio frequencies from out of the atmosphere. A tuner that will allow us to select just a very small portion of those radio waves that are coming in. A detector that converts it from radio frequencies to the audible range. An amplifier that makes it louder and a speaker that actually produces the sound. This is basically what's known as a TRF, a tuned radio frequency type radio where all the work's done up front. You filter, you tune in a station and then you just detect and amplify whatever comes out of the tuner and that's that. You could make one of these yourselves, a cardboard roll, wrap some wire around it, throw a capacitor in parallel with that, get a crystal detector, throw on some headphones, and away you go. Now you might be thinking you want to have a perfect tuner, meaning you only want to let one frequency through. So let's say we want to listen to AM 1000, it's so 1 megahertz. So great, let's design a perfect tuner that only lets 1 megahertz through, not 0 0.999 megahertz, not 1.001 1 megahertz, just 1 megahertz. If you did that, and you had a transmitter, as we do in my area, AM1000, and you set that up and you had your perfect tuner that let nothing through but 1 megahertz, you wouldn't hear anything. They kind of surprise you. It's amplitude modulation. So what I've drawn here is a carrier. Let's say this is our one megahertz, and that's what they have with the transmitter there, one megahertz. And then we have our audio, and we combine the two, and we get this, where we have one megahertz that's varying in amplitude, and it goes out to the antenna, and that's what you're picking up here. So if this was only letting through one megahertz, why wouldn't we hear it? Because once you modulate something, this is no longer just one megahertz. You may be thinking, hey, but that, that's just one megahertz. It's just varying in amplitude. So it's just one megahertz, right? No, unfortunately not. Once you modulate a carrier, whether it's AM, FM, or PM, it spreads things out. That's what we talk about the bandwidth. Bandwidth of an AM station, I think, is 10 kilohertz. Modulating, combining these two spreads out that one megahertz. So we may have this, so this is a little graph here, frequency versus amplitude. So yes, the carrier is exactly one megahertz, nothing below, nothing above, but once you modulate it, you don't have this anymore. You have... Sorry, this is why I pre-draw this stuff. It spreads it out. You get that characteristic kind of thing like this, where this is your carrier. And the more fidelity, the higher the bandwidth. So FM stations, for example, you have more fidelity. You have left and right channels. It spreads that out. TV, even more so. There's far more information. The more information you want to include, the more complex what you're modulating the carrier with, the more that spreads out. So we don't want a perfect tuner. We don't want a perfect bandpass filter. We want one that's spread out a little bit. I mean, you may be thinking, but wait a minute. When I've aligned AM radios, the alignment instructions say to peak it for 55 kilohertz, or if it's the front end, they, they, they say peak it for 1 megahertz, whatever it might be. 
that's true. And when you're peaking it, you typically have a combination of a coil and a capacitor and either it's a variable slug you're tuning or it's a variable capacitor you're tuning but the idea is the combination of these two resonates at that frequency and you're adjusting this to for that peak frequency but there it is peak frequency these components are not perfect and in, uh, in particular the inductors they don't want them to be perfect you may have heard of a the Q factor the quality factor of a coil that relates to how well it resonates in a circuit uh, typically depending on what kind of bandwidth you want you don't want I think it's a high Q factor gives you a sharper response you want to that's why designing these circuits is uh, sort of a black art to that uh, if you ever try to wind or build from scratch your own IF transformers it's not so simple this matters your core material your diameter of the coil the the spacing of your windings your winding pattern all of that plays into this you don't want an infinite response at a frequency and nothing to either side you actually want it to be a non-ideal circuit to spread this out to get a wider response that is really a big deal in TV radio is one thing where your bandwidth may be 5 kilohertz 10 kilohertz 20 kilohertz TV we're talking about 4 or 5 megahertz so this is really really wide so wide in fact you really can't you can't do it with this you can't get a, a Q factor and a capacitor combo that's going to give you a bandpass filter that wide and that's why it gets more complicated that's why it's not like a radio where you just go through well you just peak this peak this peak this peak, peak this and you're done not that simple because of this because this is so wide we can't do it with one of these so how do they do it well there's there's several different techniques one simple way to get more bandwidth that a lot of early TV designs implemented is to take advantage of the fact that you're going to need several amplification stages the earlier tubes used just didn't have enough gain so you'd have three four even five stages of amplification between the tuner and the pitcher tube well we can use that resonant circuit with a certain Q factor and stagger them they call it a staggered IF or stagger tuning meaning you set each stage to have a different peak response frequency this is an example from an actual design where they used uh, 22 megahertz 25.3 megahertz 23.5 individually each stage would have a different peak response frequency but if you add them all up all those individual peaks you get something like this with a much wider pass band than you could ever get with any individual stage each stage is simply a transformer with a movable slug two coils of wire and two fixed capacitors similar to what I'm sure you've seen in a radio so imagine you took your basic uh, AM radio and had your various IF stages that are all tuned to 455 put one at 450 one at 455 one at 460 your overall response would be three times wider or thereabouts so that is one really common way on early designs later designs two factors came into play one tubes had more gain and they want to reduce costs at least with the lower end sets so we don't want to have five stages we don't want to have four stages. we want to have two stages how the heck are you going to do this with only two stages well you're not the other thing that came into play was color television 
they wanted to keep color TV backwards compatible with black and white TVs. Well, they already had all these standards defined about how much bandwidth they're going to allocate to a TV channel, and they'd already assigned the stations and built their transmitters and all that, so they weren't going to change the standard bandwidth allocation, which was about 6 megahertz per channel. So what did they do? They decided to sacrifice image quality to add color information. So they took off a chunk of this, about 1 megahertz slice, devoted it to color info, which meant for the actual image, the luminance, you, they shrunk the passband. Meaning you could get, instead of having three of these lumps, you could get by with two. It wouldn't be ideal, often the response curve on those, instead of being this perfect flat top plateau, it's more like a double hump. But for most viewers, good enough. Another way to do this is to really dampen that Q. I said earlier you can only do so much with the Q factor. On its own with the powdered iron core and the coil of wire, yes. But there's something else you can do. Instead of capacitors, put resistors in there. Uh, which turn this into a really non-ideal inductor. There's also a thing called overcoupling, where, uh, I forget the exact technique, you either wind the coils on top of each other, or there might be some additional coupling between them, which, again, has the effect of widening it, but not ideally, where you get the same type of double hump response. So that would let them go by with two stages, but it'd be reduced bandwidth, and there'd be a dip in the middle, and the sides wouldn't quite be as straight either. So those are your various techniques. So you'll see some sets where there are three, four, five different frequencies that you're going to be peaking little transformers to. But sometimes there's only two frequencies that you peak it to. And that would be with your overcoupled or uh, reduced bandwidth type designs. Now something else I want to throw in here. You may have heard the term sideband, single sideband, lower sideband, upper sideband, vestigial sideband. The video information in television is amplitude modulated. So just like this diagram I showed with you, you got your carrier, you got your modulation. So instead of sound, it's going to be video, it's going to be light and dark. Uh, this is symmetrical, the, the modulation is symmetrical. There's a technique you can use where, and this again, this is not technically how it works, but conceptually I think you can get it. We only need half of this. So we have this line, so we're varying the amplitude of this carrier. The top and the bottom are, are moving at the same, in the same way. Well, let's just eliminate the bottom and just transmit the top part. So I showed this diagram here with your uh, the frequency being spread out by the modulation. Just don't include that. Only transmit one side of it. The upper side band. You cut your bandwidth in half. It's fantastic. However, that's not easy to do. Especially back then. So this I find rather interesting footnote of uh, engineering history, technology history. A lot of the way the standards ended up being, the designs ended up being, it's not what they wanted to do. It's what they had to do to make it economically feasible and practical because of technology limitations. They couldn't make a perfect single sideband transmitter receiver setup. So what they did is they compromised where they have, it's mostly upper sideband, but there's some lower sideband, that's the vestigial sideband. That's a little bit of one side of it. So if they had made it perfect, they could have actually packed more picture info into that 6 megahertz chunk, or they would, would either they could have used less bandwidth and had more stations, or they could have increased the resolution of the picture and uh, used in that same amount of bandwidth. 
that's why they can do something like HDTV, but it's still only six megahertz per channel. It's like more advanced modulation techniques, technology got more sophisticated. You can do fancier stuff. Uh, so we'll get more of that when we look at this actual curve. This, this response curve is not actually just a perfect square. It's actually angled on one side because of this. So very analogous to records where they have that RIAA uh, response curve because of the way records were cut and the way they were played back. They bake that into the circuitry. Same with this. They knew to make transmitters cost-effective and receivers cost-effective, they had to compromise on how they modulated the signal. But they baked all that into the IF response curve and the way the circuitry works. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> Let's put some of this together and talk about what is actually being transmitted and received. So this is the NTSC broadcast standard signal. Each station was allocated 6 megahertz of bandwidth. Within that, only 4.5 are actually used for useful information. Part of it is because of that vestigial sideband, that's the chunk over here on the left we just don't care about. They also added about a quarter megahertz guard band on either side so the stations wouldn't bleed into each other. Even so, way back at the dawn of TV, they would never have adjacent stations in the same broadcast area. You wouldn't have channels 3 and 4 in the same city. Uh, they, they just they were they would have bled into each other a little bit potentially, and they didn't want to worry about that. And quite frankly, there were so few stations; most cities only had one or two or three channels anyway, so it wasn't really an issue. All right, so within that, the biggest chunk of this is what I call luminance. That is your black and white picture information. Black, white. That's, that's, that's your picture, that's the image that you're seeing, they call it luminance in more scientific terms. That is amplitude modulated. Way over here on the right, there's a little bit of a gap, and then there's a peak here. That is your audio, that is FM. That is 4.5 megahertz out from uh, uh, the start of the... Uh, the past the video information rather and that I forget the exact width it's 20 kilohertz something like that now to get color remember I said they sacrificed some of the bandwidth yeah they took some of this luminance and they carved out a chunk of it and at 3.579 megahertz centered around that they put their color info chrominance or chroma so that's that color burst frequency you may have heard of this is phase modulated, video, amplitude modulated, sound, frequency modulated, color, phase modulated. That's how they can put all three of them inside of this and they don't step on each other. Different modulation techniques. So yeah, that was, <laughs> uh, well, I'll try to demonstrate this. If you have an older TV like this one I have right back here, 1948 TV, before there was a color standard that was accepted, they assumed that all this would be black and white picture info. So the color info just comes tearing right through to your screen as if it was amplitude modulated. And you see the color manifest as chroma dots on the screen. The color information actually messes up the image. So uh, that's why later sets, they just cut this off from the luminance circuit. We don't want it. It's just going to screw things up. But the older sets, they, they, they don't know about this, so it, it just comes right through. So that, that is our challenge, is to tweak our circuits such that the luminance info goes through the video. The chrominance info goes to the color circuit. The FM portion goes to the sound circuit. That's why you typically have different, not typically, you do have different sections in the alignment instructions for the video IF, the sound IF, the color IF, 
We'll be talking more about those in the next installment when we actually try to do alignment. And talk, so talk about how to set up the equipment, where to inject the signals, what to tweak, and what you're looking for in the response. But this is what we're trying to achieve. So we got a whole bunch of RF coming through from the ether into our set. We're trying to tame it. We want to pick one channel, so we want a 6 megahertz chunk of all that RF coming in. And within that 6 megahertz, we want to carve out a chunk for AM video info, a chunk for PM color info, and a chunk for audio FM info. That's going to be it for now. If I uh, confused you, please let me know, and I'll try to clarify things. If I got something wrong, please let me know. I will try to do a correction, or uh, just let me know what you think.